Hey guys, welcome back to another flat top. You've seen this one before. It is the Gibson B25, 1962-1963. There was an episode above where we talked about the horrendous idea that a plastic bridge was going to be the future of the Gibson trademark. Remember this one? Plastic bridge, galvanized roofing screws, or the equal to. Hey, do you notice that I am wearing a, where's that light coming from? Oh, see that light? My mother-in-law, my third one, said that there's something crazy in his eyes. There it is. Goes from one to the other. Anywhere I, I'm wearing these glasses because, you know, you guys, you follow me because you like to hide in the shed and work on a yard sale guitar while there are other people out there holding themselves out as luthiers. Yeah, if there is a word that is very hard to put your finger on, oh, by sign language, on, off, on, off. If there's a word to put exactly what it means, your finger on exactly what it means, it's definitely luthier. So, um, ignore the bibs and focus on the glasses because I look smart enough to work on this thing. What we're going to do now is we are going to, you remember we put holes, we filled holes, we plugged holes, because there's a different bridge going on here, and guess what? It doesn't match up. So now we're going to have to prep the bridge area right here, and you can tell even from there, finish that was exposed, finish under the bridge that wasn't exposed. Plus, there's a line of finish that goes all around this thing. My goofy. That's up there. It says... ASS at the end. Anyway, I'm going to tell you some things that are kind of crucial that I have not heard a lot before about number one, how to get rid of that lacquer line or spray paint line, whatever it is you're doing to seat the new bridge on here because if you do it wrong it's like tear on the dotted line i did a really weird thanksgiving episode where i had a flashback to the rig up trucks of the oil fields that i used to run and this professorousness is educated look and it got all confused but you might want to see the middle of that one it talks about the strains that go on a bridge like this rather than one that has a tailpiece, etc., like the junk we usually work on. Anyway, I'm babbling on and on. Let's set up the overhead autopsy cam because that's going to be the best view of how we're going to, is the word work on this thing? That's another word that's really hard to put your finger on, on, off, on. I'm going to teach you sign language. So, Tammy knows what you're talking about. She can hear, but she ignores most of us because, well, that's what's coming out of our mouth. Okay, let's get to the workbench. Okay, guys, I think that I did quite a bit of setup ahead of time here so we can save some time, okay? A lot of marks here, um, and let me... Let me tell you why. If you remember, if I covered this in the front end of it during the opening, don't worry about it. It's just reinforcement. But we're going to put a new bridge on, and the holes did not match up on the new bridge. There's other things that didn't match up on the new bridge, and uh, one of them was the physical size of the new bridge. This isn't the new bridge. I'm just going to kind of show you what's going on here. And you can... You can hear that this is teeter-tottering. And the reason for that is because there's some work to be done here on the holes we filled. Remember, there was some self-adjusting, one, two, three, four, five, six, which leaves us 
this hole and this hole that was self-adjusting or uh, for an adjustment uh, bolt or whatever you want to call it on the plastic bridge. And then there was a, a spot that um, positioned the bridge. Now, there's a couple things about putting a new bridge on. Um, first off, it's not going to be the same size. And that's going to be really important as to a number of things. First off, I went around, around to where the edge of the old bridge was. Okay? It's here. And here, this was the back line. And then it was up here. Okay? That was the front line. So, we know... Well, maybe we don't know. Let's get this out of the way here. We need to know where the center of things are. So, I went along, and trust me, I'm putting this straight edge along the side of the... You know what? Let's move the guitar down a little bit. Stumac Workstation helps us out quite a bit here with this kind of thing. There we go. Get that lined up so nobody has to go to therapy. But take the straight edge. I'm going to use the metric side because I usually did. And put it up quite a ways on the neck and left it be. Notice that there's tape here. And put a mark there. And then I did the same thing. But this pit guard is going to get in the way a little bit. So I'm going to tilt this so my mark doesn't get warped out or distracted by the pit guard and I made a mark there so there's one there and one there now we know that because the fretboard gets slightly wider on this some of the other guitars that I work on it gets pronouncedly <laughs> wider and so what I did here was I measured between these two marks there and there and came up with the center Another thing we need to worry about is you're going to have to trust me on this one, but these bridges, the slot where the saddle goes is tilted. You can see that. It's closer here than here. So what matters is the center needs to be at the intonation point. This is an attempt to intonate the bridge automatically where the bass strings tend to be in the right side and the treble strings are in the right position in comparison to intonation. And what that means is we take our trusty hardware stick. This part is going to sit at the back of the nut, which is intact. If it's not and you're doing this on a guitar, then you just make sure that this is at the end of the fingerboard where the nut begins. And then you go to the middle of the 12th fret, and right here, there's a G right there, 25, meaning this guitar. And I put, oh, look at this one. That might be for a 1918 Gibson L4. Who knows? But anyway, the middle of the 12th fret is right there. So now I'm going to take this end and put it in the middle of the 12th fret way over here on the bass side and you see that line matches up with this line and then I'm going to go to the treble side of the 12th fret and I'm going to put this line and match it with this line and then I'm going to find at the middle where that is so when we put the new bridge on the middle of the bridge, meaning the distance between all these pins right there in the middle, that has to be right there. It doesn't can't be forward or back because you will be forever out of tune. It will never, ever be in tune. And, and that's an important part about setting where your bridges go, whether they're either fixed or floating. Okay, I'm going to pull this tape back for a little bit here to make a point. Now you can see that there's some kind of whitish residue here. But this is 
where the front of the bridge going towards the sound hole was the old bridge. And you can see that it curves down right there. Now you can see that underneath this bridge, the stock bridge, the color of the guitar of the soundboard, the top of the guitar is different than the part that was exposed. So when you put a different bridge on, I keep using this one, this isn't the bridge we're gonna use, and it doesn't line up where it needs to. By the way, the holes here that we filled are going to need to be drilled once we do some work here. And we're going to have to line those up with the old holes. No, not necessarily. They may line up, but again, the center of this needs to be at the intonation point. Okay? But, now, nobody wants to be able to look at a guitar first thing and say, oh, I see. You replace the bridge because there's the old finish and the new finish. And on top of that, in addition to this rocking back and forth we got going on here because there's still some of these that haven't been finished. We'll get to that in a minute. There is a line of finish right there. You can hear it if I shut my mouth. So I got an idea. Before we take off the old bridge... We just take this razor knife and we trace very carefully at that line, right? And then we take some kind of a chisel or like this and very carefully do this or, or use a piece of plastic or something. No, you do not want to do that. And here is why. Let's say I take a piece of paper like my script that I shoot off of in the background. Okay, I'm going to tear a piece off this. We're going to sacrifice this. You may want me to autograph this and send it to you or something. But let's say that unlike the fiber in this paper, the grain on this guitar runs this way. You can see it, right? Now, we stop splitting by placing braces this way or diagonally, but we don't put braces or even cleats when we fix things where the grain of the fix runs the same way as the top. So let's say that I fold this piece of paper like so. And I have a pronounced line like this. Is doing that not the same as taking this razor knife and going along that line to get rid of that buildup, or maybe we even, we're real smart, we come in like this and do that. Is that smart? No, it's not, because here's why. When we make a cut, I don't care what kind of microscope you want to use or, or what you have. I have something really cool to show you on an old Gibson where if you can't read something on the paper, it will help you. That will help you in this case too. But if I put a line right here and score a line, if I get on a microscope, I'm gonna find out that I have created a cut across the grain right here, okay? Why is that important? Well, because we've already talked about the teeter-totter effect here. So, in that, in that movie I showed you, which is right up there, right about now, a link. Yeah, there we go. That Thanksgiving Day weird special. Look at it this way. The strings are pulling up right here. There's a bridge plate underneath here. Okay, but the whole stress of everything pulling this way is right here. Okay, so when a teeter-totter rocks back and forth, if this goes up, this is going to press down. So guess what? Let's put that press down and pull up at a spot where we have fractured the grain. So what's going to want to happen? 
we have basically made a cut on the dotted line right here. And when this tilts like this, any pressure is going to cause an indentation in that little piece of paper. Remember, if we just tear it, where is it going to tear? Oh, look, it tore right there where we folded it. Imagine that. Don't do that. So what do you do? Well, a couple things here. We need to get our rag back up here. Do not covet my Chick Flick Teal Raggedy Ann and Andy Rag. Yeah, you guys can be the co-stars. I'll give you credit on this one. Okay, so some glues, believe it or not, are water soluble. Say we have this fancy bowl here. So if you look inside, yeah, there's Chick Flick Teal in there. See it? There's also a piece of wet dry sandpaper that's purple it has a number of thousand associated to it i'm going to keep that in here now right along that glue line we're going to take a little bit of water not too much we're going to wet that like so we're going to let it soak in a little bit and then we're going to start going back and forth and what do you know, whatever that is, it might be lacquer, it might be something, but most of that stuff doesn't like water. So the water starts to go to work on it. Now, we also have that problem, let me wipe this off here for a second. We have that problem where, look, you can see where the old bridge was digging in, the front of the bridge, that rotational force. Anyway, if you look here, you can see that there is a difference between what was under the bridge and what was not under the bridge. And to further compound things, the new bridge is not going to be the exact same size. Because if you look, when we line that up back here, there's about a millimeter and a half showing. That's not going to work good for us. And none of that has anything to do with where the intonation point is. So regardless of what's happening here, now we can see that's really pronounced as that water dries. So what are we going to do? Well, the first thing we're going to do is not tear up the pit guard. So we're going to stand a piece of this on its edge and follow that contour and then pin it down. Who cares if it wads up? And then we're going to ever keep in this wet. We are going to fool the old and new finish to thinking that they're related to each other somehow. We're going to take the thousand grit and we're going to work away, away from the old finish and into the new now if you hear this is really delicate work by the way guys we're going to fool everybody into thinking that they're the old wood Okay, now you'll be able to hear. See, that line, whatever it was, is gone in this area. We don't want to be getting in the habit of getting all frustrated and going sideways. We just want to, now listen. See, it's hanging up now. It's cutting loose. Don't be afraid to take your brush. Use the right size brush, by the way, guys. Let's see what's going on here. See, the, the adhesive on the back of the binding tape is not liking the water either to the point. But anyway, you're going to get rid of that line and you're going to make that color offset 
less pronounced. So I have to do that myself once I, but I think you guys get the point. Thousand grit, it's the purple stuff, find the purple stuff. Don't be afraid to let this sit and dry out for a little bit, but once this is all cleaned, the whole body is cleaned, you're gonna find out that this, yeah, now we're hearing some squeaky, and um, that line is physically less pronounced because of the removal of the glue and the lacquer or the finish, whatever it was, and also because a little bit of taking some of the top off of the old finish makes it more palatable to the new finish where things aren't going to match up. Like so. Don't you hate it when I turn on the camera and it wiggles for a while? Take advantage of that. You might be able to quit smoking or whatever. Anyway, I'm going to take advantage of putting this tape back here because remember, I need to know where the old bridge was. That's really important. And I'm going to set uh, my watercolor stuff off to the side. Um, and now we're going to talk about the new bridge, the one I am going to use. It's roughed up on the bottom. Um, use a rotational tool to put your marks in there where the glue is going to grab. Because if you use a chisel or something, remember, whenever you push with a chisel, wood is taken away, but wood is, basically the density of it has changed. All you're doing is there's parenchyma spaces between the wood vessels or xylem and phloem or whatever you want to call it, and they can compress. So if I take a chisel and push on this, all I'm doing is condensing the parenchyma cells, and you end up with something that will never be flat. So once you get your bridge flat, find a way to make these spots where the glue is going to stick to keep away from this area. But the more surface there is, you don't want to make these marks in here, but that's a good. Now, remember me telling you about the center? Well, I need to know where the center of the bridge is. Not because of any of this, but basically where the strings are going to line up and most notably where that intonation point is going to be. See? Right there. And there. And there and there. So if I know where all of that is, there's one more measurement I need to do and that's this measurement and I'll put a mark there, but that is how I will set my intonation point. Now, off to the next thing. These bridge pins or holes for bridge pins that I had to dowel because the new bridge is not going to match the holes and we're going to have to drill new ones. There's some teeter-tottering going on there. It got helped out a little bit by the tape, but again, notice that the new bridge is going to not be the same size as the other one, but this has to be flat right here. So, a couple ways to address that. First, the best way is razor blade scotch tape. You see that? There's a spot in the middle there, right there, that's open, and I have the benefit of having this binding tape in addition to the scotch tape to give me some tolerance there to stay above the soundboard of the guitar. So I'm simply going to go like this and scrape until I start to see something happening on the tape here. See that? Now, it seems that this is not the best way to do this, but trust me, it is. You're not gonna get anything faster. You're not gonna gain any time by doing it another way. Okay, I can turn it on its side a little bit if I want to. I wanna be careful about doing this. It's a good way to cut yourself, but it's kind of a gauge to tell you how much needs to come off. Now! Let me show you if you want to do something far more drastic if they're sticking up quite a bit. And that is 
I got this from Stu Mac. It's wonderful. It has no teeth on the side. Could you make a file like this yourself by simply running the, the teeth from the side off on a belt sander? Sure you could. But this little file takes a lot of wood quickly. Now, you'll notice that I have some binding tape here. Well, why is that? Well, I want to work an area. You see the relationship between the tape? If I'm working... Let's lay this down here. If I'm working this area of the file being open, and this area is shorter than the boundary set by this tape, the likelihood that I'm going to gouge into this is lessened. And on top of that, I have yet another layer of binding tape here. So if I've got one that's sticking way up, I'm still going to work that one with a razor blade, but this one is up pretty high. I can lay this relatively flat or get my hand underneath it like this and just, as long as the ends stay over the tape, I'm going to be good to go. See that? Now again, if this wasn't here, I would be gouging everything, but I can just... Now... You see, the end of that file is hitting that tape. I don't want that to happen. So if I'm still taking material off, that tape is kind of like the bumpers at the bowling alley. Yeah, when you Google my name, I'm everybody but the bowler. People are like, are you the guitar guy? Yeah, are you the arborist? Yeah, are you the guy that wrote the articles about palm trees? Yeah, yeah. Are you the, yeah, but I'm not the bowler. Apparently there's a bowler with my name was very good. Now again, notice that we're not cutting into the tape where we're at. That's getting close. This one's a lot better. That center one for locating everything was a little bit higher than the rest. That's because there's another one right next to it. I didn't like that much. I like to have some separation between the wood plugs because if one goes they both will but again you see how this happens and of course you want to take a brush which I have in the background over here uh, and keep those teeth clean the file is only as good as the teeth are clean think about if you have no teeth how it is to eat corn yeah, it's okay. I'll be your dietitian too. See what happens when you let me do monotonous tasks that make me calm down? I start getting all theoretic. Besides that, if I have to go through the misery of all of this, you will too. I hope you're learning that, again, this is all taped off if... Your file area that's open on the cutting side stays this part here and this part here doesn't go outside of there, you're going to be fine. See, that one just tried to dig in there, so that one's pretty, pretty good. This one's not doing anything. Now, you start getting to the super luthiers, kind of like them super truckers in the oil fields. They had to have all kinds of chrome stacks and God knows what. Anyway, this is called a finger plane. You can set the edge however you want. Now, when you start doing this kind of stuff, you've got one that's particularly scary. I'm not leaving this whole thing open. I'm just going to this area here, and I am marking off only what I want to hit with the finger plane. So get one that has something that you can hold on to the top and nice and and then you gotta set your you gotta set the depth you want. You see that? This is my least favorite thing to use. But it get, it, it will get you close. If you're not comfortable with the file thing, you can just march down. edge here. Like so, finger plane. 
Okay, finally, when it's getting where you're feeling, everything is feeling pretty good right here, you can turn your razor on its side. Again, remembering that the tape is there. You get it just as flat as possible and do this. And you're gonna run across a spot or two maybe. It feels right here where, again, you're using the, you're using the, the top of the guitar and everything being flat. And you've got this tape on the side. Remember, you got this buffer of this tape and the scotch tape. So you're laying this on its side. And you're just kind of going across those and rocking it back and forth like so. Again, this is tedious work. And I can see that I'm getting really close because this tape now on the razor is fraying the edge of the binding tape on top of the guitar and everything is feeling. I get a couple of slivers here and there doing it this way, but I'm just rocking back and forth, which is cutting the fibers. You're coming at this from the end grain. Remember what you're working on. Don't start pressing so hard you go through the top of the guitar. Get a little problem spot right there. Remember the rule. Keep the ends of the file in this zone. There we go. Okay, I care about you guys so much that I'm going to tear this off here now because I have my center mark here and I have my center mark here and here and here. And so I am going to get rid of this stuff here now and I'm going to go to work on... Let's tear this off here. You can see that area between here and here, and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. The old footprint of the bridge is clearly right there. And so we are going to, ooh, it's very pronounced right there. So we're gonna do the old water and thousand grit. Now, what are we gonna do when we get to this area? We're gonna sand this. No, we're constantly gonna go with the grain, okay? Oh, before I forget, check this out. Note this, pay close attention. It's beveled one side more than the other. It's a dowel. Look in here, check this out. This rotates up. This fits in here like so, by friction only, and you hold it like this. What is this, you might ask? Well, if you look in there, where's Chick Flick Tail Pointer? Wake up. You're not off just because it's Sunday. You're a seven day a week person. This looks a lot like a microscope and it has two lights on it. One is a blue light, one is a bright light. See, here, let me blind you. There we go. Now, you can stick this down into a hole and you can look at where currency has been worn or dated. You can see things you can't see with the naked eye like maybe a pencil marking a piece of paper label inside of a 1918 Gibson L4 and the sun and other things have worn everything away until it's at a point where you can only see the broken fibers where the pencil pushed down and pressured the paper or along the line where someone has replaced a bridge and scored it with a razor like I told you not to. Handy. Oh, you want to keep this thing in your go look at guitars case, that's for sure. But notice I've got a piece of tape here. 
I'm laying it on the edge of the pit guard like so because I have to work that area right there. That squeak is such a nice, nice sound, isn't it? A little bit more right there. And what do you know, me doing this part right here where the old bridge back was, I get to do some very fine wet dry on the dowels that I use to fill the hole so I can punch in new bridge pin holes here. That's looking a lot better right there. I'm trying to make it disappear. Kind of like, I wish it was this easy with mother-in-laws, you know it. All right, we are at the end of this part of the project. You can still see the bridge line, but it's faint. And the last part we have to work on is right there. The final finish on this guitar will hide a bunch of this, but again, the trick here is to get rid of anything that's standing up. That's gone. We're going to learn a lot about how these fills worked here and how they go back and forth ultimately by putting the bridge on here. And of course, there's going to be a few little things that don't match up but it's an old guitar on the top anyway the main thing is blending that old bridge line the stuff is awesome Bingo. Okay, now we're at a critical point where, remember the intonation mark, we've got everything centered up. We know where everything needs to be. I'm gonna put a piece of sandpaper on here and work this bridge back and forth like this, like we would to fit to an arch top because we know that this is not perfectly like marble table level. But most important thing now is I've got our stick in the middle of the 12th fret and this mark right here needs to be in the middle of the slot for the saddle and maybe you look at it this way I've got that 
B25 mark right there in pencil. It says B25, and it's right there. And this right here is the middle. Everything lined up this way, this way, all good. I think this is a good time to close this one out. Do I look smarter in these glasses? I do? <laughs> Joke's on you, partners. Look, here's the takeaway on these bridges. I've been talking a lot about this idea of a direct pull where this side goes up and this side goes down. And it's a relatively short teeter-totter. It would be different if it were like this, but there's a great deal of pressure here. So you have to be careful when you're working against the grain, taking a razor knife or something and being smart and saving some time and tracing along the edge and calling it a day. That is not going to work out for you. The fact that the bridge failed in the first place, that's usually an indicator to me. For example, I don't go out and buy a car that has 300,000 miles on it with, when the one I'm driving has 300,000 miles on it when it failed and I don't go out looking for the exact same brand. I might look for another brand knowing that it will fail in 300,000 miles or the same brand or whatever, blah, blah, blah. We're getting way off out in the weeds of this theocratic, theocratic style of uh someone told me what is it they called my stream of consciousness <laughs> whatever people if you got it if you can't think of words that describe me make them up just give me a like and subscribe if you haven't anyway guys use care working around these things line them up you don't get a second chance when you're drilling holes and and, and plugging holes and something that's meant to be acoustically pleasing. Remember, there's a cubed relationship between the thickness of the soundboard and the sound it creates. So when you're beefing stuff up and you're making it thicker and you're putting all kinds of stuff in there, people buy acoustic guitars because they want to hear them acoustically. Isn't that the most profound thing you have ever heard? Good. You think about that till I show up on your screen next time. Remember, it's up to you whether you click that button or not.